leadership is moving towards democracy, albeit hesitantly and without much conviction. Midday reporter Paul Lockyer has just returned from Burma and he compiled this report just for Sunday. This is democracy in action in Burma, a very rare sight. Opposition politicians simply haven't been allowed here for 26 years. The military has run this country with an iron fist for all that time. As Aung San Suu Kyi, the most popular opposition figure in Burma, works the people, the security forces are always close by. The military is clearly uncomfortable with the concept of democracy. This is what happens when you try to train a camera on them. In this, a country ruled by the repressive military for so long, there are severe restrictions on campaigning. It has to be mostly done in overcrowded homes. It takes courage to be an opposition politician here. Su Chi, the daughter of a revered Burmese independence fighter, has no shortage of that. And even though she has spent most of her life in Britain, there's no question about the wide support she commands. Politically, we're starting to have to learn it all over again. We're having to start from scratch. After 26 years of, of a complete um, divorce from politics, as it were, the people have to start learning all over again how to cope with a situation where political parties are allowed in spite of all the restrictions. She's being called the Benazir Bhutto of Burma, but it's very debatable whether Suu Kyi can parallel the rise by Benazir in Pakistan. After all, this experiment in democracy in Burma is only being tolerated by the military because of all the trouble there last year. The troops turned their guns on pro-democracy demonstrators, just as brutally as the Chinese military did recently in Beijing. The world condemned the bloodshed in Burma. It had started with spontaneous protests against a political and economic system that had taken the country backwards. Because of long-standing bans against media coverage, the world had to rely on amateur videotape and a few photographs to record the turbulent events. The government claims that close to 600 people died. Reliable independent accounts put the slaughter by the military at a staggering 3,000 or more. Hello. Hello, Hello. Burma is now run by a military regime that calls itself the State Law and Order Restoration Council. It's supposed to be a caretaker government, holding power only long enough to stamp out anarchy. But for a short-term administration, they've made sweeping changes, especially in the economic field. The chief architect of all those reforms is Colonel David Abel, trade minister and Burma's new economic czar. It was time, he believed, to finally bury socialism. Uh, at the time uh, when we had these disturbances, uh, I think, I think it, is, it was uh, most of the people were badly hit by the economic situation and uh, on gauging this, this economic situation uh, we had to do, we have to move, we had to move 180 degrees around you see, so when you move 180 degrees from socialism it becomes capitalism but surely it, sh it can't just have been economic factors, it must have been the repression that was existing in this yes, country yes of course, That's, that, that is uh, not, 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 not repression I mean the, the depression not repression, depression. There's no doubt that the Burmese economy was in a deep depression. It's been so for years. To distract the population from their continuing problems, the military regime has embarked on a swag of public works projects to finally spruce up Burma. capital, Rangoon, hasn't changed much though since the Second World War.
glance, Rangoon seems to have returned to its backwater normality. But the fact is that last year's troubles have significantly changed the political game here. The ruling military regime has been forced to give the people a whiff of democracy, the promise of elections within 12 months. Many Burmese, once scared to even consider the prospect of democratic reform, are now anxious to keep the military honest. Burma has entered a very uncertain and volatile period. The Burmese people have long been ruled by fear. Suspected opponents of the government have been dealt with ruthlessly, often tortured. Government spies are everywhere and telephone tapping is assumed by everyone. Student dissidents say little has changed. After the military onslaught on protesters last year, many students fled to Karen rebel camps near the border with Thailand. Some have now taken up arms against the government. Others who answered government calls to return on the promise that they wouldn't be prosecuted have since been jailed. Could you ask him? He's been arrested. Those student three leaders times. that are still no free are keeping a low profile, but their resolve has not been dented. Min Zia fled Rangoon for the jungle after last year's assault by the military. He's now bedridden with malaria and typhoid. I've been arrested three times. I was treated brutally. I was given electric shock torture, as were all the other students, and it's still going on. Does he believe then there can ever be democracy in Burma? The military government will never give us democracy. If we want democracy, we'll have to fight for it, and we will fight. Fate played a hand in bringing Aung San Suu Kyi to the centre of the fight for democracy in Burma. Last year she left her home in Britain and her family, a British husband and two sons, to return to Burma to see her dying mother. She was caught up in the trouble and has now told her family that she'll be staying in Burma indefinitely. What does the family that you've left behind overseas think about all this? Oh, they're very supportive. My husband has always accepted that my, my country will come first and my sons accept that as well. This is a very uncertain time. Do you ever feel that your personal safety is at risk here? I don't think very much about it. Of course people mention this from time to time that uh, there might be assassination attempts and I should be careful and uh, a lot of my well-wishers are worried about this but one doesn't have time to think about that from day to day. There's so much else to do. Burma has a lot of catching up to do, politically and economically. It's considered to be one of the poorest countries on earth. It should never have descended to that. Burma was one of the richest countries in Asia, once the world's biggest rice exporter. That was before the country was thrust into a time warp in the 60s. It was cut off from the world and became one of the most mysterious countries in Asia. Disastrous attempts at central economic planning, the Burmese way to socialism, plunged the country into poverty. One man was responsible for all of that, the camera-shy military strongman Nay Win, seen here greeting Princess Anne in a rare photo opportunity two years ago. His tyrannical and crippling rule adds another chapter to Burma's turbulent history. In place of the Union Jack, the Burmese national flag was hoisted with all due ceremony. And a few hours later, the last governor of Burma, Sir Hubert Rance, went down to the docks with his wife to start his journey home. The British finally granted Burma independence in 1948. A Burmese independence struggle had started in the 20s. The Second World War, which engulfed Burma, helped persuade Britain that it should set the colony free. 
The British realized the deep commitment of the Burmese freedom fighters when they joined the Japanese in the battle for the country. It was only late in the war when an Allied victory seemed certain that the Burmese guerrillas switched sides to fight with the British. Don't let the hangdog appearance deceive you. At any time in the presence of this honorable Japanese, you keep your finger on the trigger. After the war, the quest for Burmese independence was successfully pursued by the leader of the freedom fighters, Aung San. Aung San is remembered as Burma's greatest hero, as the man who eventually unshackled this country from the forces of colonialism. Many of his old comrades, retired military men who form a very influential group in Burma, have now decided to turn against the forces of repression here. And they believe that only one person, Aung San's daughter, Su Chi, can finally lead this country to democracy. U Tinu, a former army chief of staff, leads the politically powerful old comrades. He and many other officers who rose to high rank were purged and jailed by Nay Win at one time or another to prevent any challenge to his leadership. They believe that Aung San Suu Kyi possesses all of her father's fighting qualities and will not be swayed from her objective of finally ending military rule. She is very sincere and uh, very competent and a very firm lady and uh, courageous. The, with the spirit of her father. So the people are thinking that she is the only one that she can just restore back uh, democracy again to Burma as her father has been given already before. What in fact, what strength or what popularity do you draw from your father amongst the people here? A lot of strength and a lot of popularity. They accepted me in the first place because I'm my father's daughter and I think most of my political ideas and uh, principles have come from him. And what have you built since then, since that acceptance? I think we've, we've built a considerably strong movement for democracy. We've managed to unite all the forces who want democracy to a certain extent. Not as much as I would like, but we're working towards that. Aung San Suu Kyi accuses Australia of working against her efforts to bring democracy to Burma. The controversy surrounds this Australian aid project at Mandalay, the construction of a milk factory. Australia and many other countries cut off aid to Burma last year in protest against the military assault on the pro-democracy demonstrators. But Australia was quick to resume this project, sparking the charge that Canberra is playing a cynical political game. Australia, I think, should take a firmer stand about what what role it wants to play. Does it want to play a role as a country which supports the movement for democracy and stands up for human rights? Or does it think that it's more important... Support your groups, then? I don't just mean my group, but all those who are working for democracy. Or does Australia want to uh, make sure that it keeps in the good graces of this present regime? Australia's ambassador to Burma, Christopher Lamb, denies that Canberra is cozying up to the military regime. Well, I don't want to get involved, of course, in a debate with her about anything relating to Burmese politics, and I can't do that, and I wouldn't want to. Uh, I think the, the easiest thing for me to say is, is a point she made herself, that we have maintained dialogue with both sides. And I believe that by using that dialogue with discretion and care, that we can certainly advance the claims of the Burmese people to the democracy they seek. The Mandalay Milk Factory is defended by Australia on humanitarian grounds. This is one of the reasons why it's considered to be such an important project, ending these unhygienic village bath factories, crudely producing sweetened condensed milk. Australia argues that it would also help the farmers of the area develop their dairy industry and lift living standards. All those pluses don't wash, though, with Aung San Suu Kyi. She believes such assistance now only helps legitimise the military regime. The excuse that Australia gives, or, or some Australians give, is that by having good relations with the regime, they can help the movement for democracy because they're in a position to, to talk, to open a dialogue. I must say, I take it all, with that, all that with a pinch of salt. Aung San Suu Kyi doesn't want anyone doing business with the military rulers. 
She's worried that they'll use their switch to capitalism to woo the outside world. There's no doubt that the policy switch is having an impact now, at home and abroad. This is the crossroads for all that trading activity, the booming market of Mandalay in central Burma. An army of merchants has emerged to take full advantage of the unleashed consumer demand here, and they're funneling in goods from neighbouring Thailand, China and India. Burma's military rulers are in a hurry now to make up lost ground. The country's natural resources are largely untapped, locked away while the rest of the world plundered theirs. Water buffalo haul teak logs out of the Irrawaddy River, as they've done for decades. Huge timber reserves remain in Burma, along with minerals and petroleum. Australia's BHP has shown interest in the new big oil search here. How do you think the world is now viewing all these changes, particularly the changes in trade? Well, you know, they're coming. They're coming. They're coming in their droves? Yes, yes, they're coming. Many are coming now. They probably can't believe that Burma wants them now. I don't know. That's left up to them. <laughs> but they're coming to see for themselves, and uh, I think uh, we are making progress. So Burma is ripe for the picking? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, yes, very, very ripe. Very ripe. Very ripe not for picking, for investing. There's been the accusation, in fact, that you're selling off your resources like fast foods. Oh, no, 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 no. That... It won't go that way. We will see that uh, things don't get overheated. For people who have been so isolated in a socialist state for so long, the sudden news that they're all now to become capitalists has left many bewildered. How do you explain that switch to a Burmese rice farmer? You have to tell him now, you know, he wants to sell his produce. Now we have changed the system. Huh? Okay, guys, we are, we are 180 degrees roundabout turned. Huh? So. Do you think he might say, how long is this going to last? I don't know. <laughs> well, nobody has asked me that. <laughs> how long do you think it will last? Well, I mean, as long, as long, I, I think, I think as long as the people want it, it will last. A Burmese army truck is fired up to head off to war. For 40 years, the Burmese government has been trying to put the torch to a host of rebel armies. This convoy is moving out from Tanji, the capital of the Shan state in northeastern Burma, out into no man's land. This is basically where Burmese law and order ends. Continue on down that road, the 200 kilometres to Thailand, and you enter a dangerous and bizarre world controlled by insurgents and drugs runners. Go far enough and you come to the kingdom of the opium warlord, Khun Sa. And this is just one of many areas of this country that has never been controlled by the central government. <laughs> Ethnic minority groups like the Karen have never accepted rule from Rangoon. Much of eastern Burma is controlled by the rebel armies. The armies of the Karen, the Kachin and the Shan and communist guerrillas. The question now is whether the flowering of democracy in Burma will finally persuade all those dissident groups to put down their arms. Aung San Suu Kyi is confident that it will. We'll have to work hard at it. I think it requires goodwill and open-mindedness on all sides. I think if we come to the problem with open minds and a real, in real goodwill and a very strong desire to achieve a strong union, a strong nation, I think we can do it. But how can you finally get all those disaffected groups to lay down their arms? It's not a question of how do you tell them. We've got to show them that we really care. And we've got to make them believe in us and trust us and have confidence in us. Confidence is still a fierce commodity in Burma. The people are sceptical about the promised passage to democracy, the pledge that elections will be held by next May. Many find it hard to believe that the military, which is making so many big changes, will simply stand aside and let an elected civilian government take over. But Trade Minister Colonel Abel insists that it will happen. 
And you can say confidently that the military will, even though it's, it's had a big input in how this country is run, will yes. step aside, go back to barracks? Definite, definite. And whoever is elected by the people? Definite, definite. In a fair election? Yes, yes Will govern? Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely. We have never had any ambition to be in power. Never. But the military is always pulled the strings here, hasn't it? Well, and I mean, many developing countries, all military forces are the balancing, not pull the strings, the balancing force. Do you really think that the military will let an election happen in Burma next year? I don't think it's a question of whether the military will let an election take place. It's a question of whether they can not let an election take place. And I think if the people are united enough and firm enough in their purpose, an election will have to take place. The country is at the crossroads, emerging from its socialist shell, embracing capitalism and edging towards democracy. It'll take all the strength of politicians like Aung San Suu Kyi to ensure that Burma gets its democracy. That battle may have just begun. Mm, that rare look at the mysteries of Burma by Paul Lockie with the Midday Show. Nice pictures and a very nice story.